Thank you very much. Thanks to the organizers. I'm very happy to be here and to give a talk. It's actually my first talk uh, in person after one and a half years, as for most of the speakers, I guess. So my goal, at the, uh, my goal in this lecture is to give um, very down-to-earth, uh, very approachable tourist guide type of introduction to these three subjects that are in the title. So, uh, so pretty many uh, delicacies I will hide, but I want you to give some, to have some picture of these, to have some yeah, so, so the understanding of these after the talk. Let me give a, uh, acknowledge my, my co-authors on, on different papers that are related to this story, Rosansky, Varchenko, Smirnov, Zhu, Weber, and Shu. This, this picture is the, the plan of the talk. So uh, first, uh, focus on that, on that black uh, arrow on the top left part, which says 3D mirror symmetry for characteristic classes. So that, the explanation of that double arrow will be the first half of the talk. So I try to explain what it means, uh, what, what the characteristic classes for, for some certain singularities in, in a space are, what, what are, what they are, and what does it mean that for two different spaces, in this case, in this example, I chose the Grassmannian of two planes in C5 and another space, which is a Nakajima variety decorated by that or, or defined by that red quiver. So these two uh, are, are related in terms of characteristic classes of singularities. So that is the first part of the talk, exp explanation of that black double arrow. And the, the second half of the talk will be explanation of the rest of the, the picture. I want to talk about Cherkis bow varieties. It's a, it will turn out a very convenient um, pool of spaces, more general than Nakajima varieties, and, and looking at spaces like bow varieties instead of, uh, instead of varieties or, or, or homogeneous spaces. Uh, it sort of explains why, for example, those two spaces are mirror symmetric, and, and also it will answer other questions. So this is the plan. Any questions? Then let me jump into, uh, well, let me recall this uh, notion that was already defined in, uh, in the excellent talks of uh, Joel Kamnitzer, the quiver variety. So if you see a picture like that on the left, so we call it a type A quiver, as a side remark, everything in this talk will be type A, just for simplicity. So this is a type A quiver, which means just a, a, you know, a combinatorial object which you see on the left. These Ws and Vs are non-negative integers. Associated to that picture, as, you, as we learned last week from, from, from Joel, there's a variety that, which I call script N of, of Q, uh, the, the, the Nakajima quiver variety. So I'm not repeating, I'm not going to repeat the, the definition, but here are some examples. The examples on the left are uh, familiar spaces. They are cotangent, total spaces of cotangent bundles over uh, partial flag varieties. For example, the Grassmannian you get by just uh, one portion of a quiver. And, and here is an example of a partial flag variety, or cotangent bundle of the partial flag variety. Quiver varieties are, of course, more general than cotangent bundles of partial flag varieties. Here is an example. Uh, so, uh, so this quiver variety is, is, is dimension two, and uh, it is the usual resolution of a Kleinian singularity, C2 over Z mod three. More interesting than the and the actual definition, let's see some properties of, of Q varieties. Uh, in this case, type A, they are smooth. They carry some holomorphic, carry a holomorphic symplectic form. And there is a torus action on it. So let me spend a little time on the torus action, so at least naming what the torus is. At each of the framed vertices, the framed ones are the little squares, uh, you imagine a torus of that dimension, of the dimension of W. And the product of all these tori act on the on the quiver variety, plus there is one more uh, factor, one more C star, which, uh, which comes from the fact that, that in the definition you considered the cotangent bundle of something before you, you, before you cut it down by a, by a group action, and the cotangent bundle in the cotangent direction you multiply by uh, an extra C star, which we denote by C star H. So in this, uh, in this setting, the number of fixed points, torus fixed points is finite, and uh, and we have some tautological bundles for each, each vertex on top of the quiver. So of, of rank V1, V2, and V capital N, there's a tautological, there's a bundle over the, the space. 
So this we are rather familiar with, since last week at least. So eventually I want to talk about the cohomology ring, equivalent, torus equivalent cohomology ring of the, of the Nakajima plurality. Look at the top left part. So that's what I want to explain, how I will talk about an element of the equivalent cohomology ring. So the way we will, uh, we will name elements in the equivalent cohomology ring is we will name their images under the localization map. So consider, consider this uh, map on the top left called LOC, LOC. So that is just uh, restricting a cohomology class to the torus fixed points. So, the, so it is just the most innocent map in cohomology, the restriction map. It turns out that uh, in very general situations, for example here, the localization map is injective. So, uh, so, if, right, so if I name the, the image under the localization map of an element of the cohomology ring, then I named it. This is an injective map. And why is it a simple thing? Because, because we have finitely many fixed points, so the restriction to the torus fixed points is, uh, is the sum of the restriction for uh, the cohomology ring of each fixed point, and the, the equivalent cohomology ring of a point is just a polynomial ring. So in this case, u1, u, and h bar. So, it, so the picture on the right is, of course, an example. It's uh, t star gr uh, Grassmann 2c4. It has uh, six fixed points. These are the vertices of this graph. So to name an, an equivalent cohomology class on, on the, in the cohomology of this, this uh, space, I need to uh, name a, a polynomial at each vertex. So to name a cohomology class is a tuple. At each vertex, I name a, po a polynomial in the u's and the h. I cannot name any tuple of polynomials. That's what I'm addressing in the bottom left. Uh, the image of the localization map is, uh, is not the whole thing. It, there are constraints among the components. And uh, this, this is what is uh, uh, explained or, or, or indicated by the, by the edges of this, of this picture. So for, there are invariant curves in the space, and those are the edges of the, the picture. And they, they come with some decoration. In this case, the decoration say 1, 3 on the leftmost edge. Says that uh, an element a, a top, okay, so a coordinate at that fixed point 2, 3, and the coordinate at that fixed point 1, 2, they, they, are, they cannot be independent. They have to satisfy a constraint, and the constraint is that if you plug in u1 equals u3, then they have to be equal. So these kind of constraints must be true for, for, a, for, a, for a, an image in the, in the, under the localization map. Here's an example. So you see everything that is in blue is a, is a six tuple of polynomials. And because they satisfy these consistency conditions, they do represent an element in the, in the equivalent cohomology of the Grassmannian. So let's check one constraint. So maybe the bottom right constraint, the edge decorated by 2 and 4. So that means that, means that the two, two polynomials written at the, uh, associated to the, to the vert two vertices, they have to be equal if you plug in u2 equals u4. And indeed, you will see that there's a u4 minus u2 factor on another polynomial, so they are in, indeed equal. And you can check all the others. This particular six tuple is an element in the equivalent cohomology of the Grassmannian of 2, 4. This, this particular six tuple is actually something that will be called stable, it's, it's, it's an example of a stable envelope later. This slide is just a warning uh, that I said that the components are not independent. And I said that for every edge, there is a constraint. Unfortunately, the edges actually are not always discrete. In this example, which is a Nakajima Q variety, the edges come in, in, in moduli. There is a, there's a one parameter family, a pencil of, 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 of uh, curves you see in the middle, actually at two places as well. And in those cases, the, the constraints on the, on the components are deeper than just uh, coincidence under putting uh, under some linear form. They also have to have, the coincidence have to happen not only for the polynomials, but for some higher derivatives as well. So the, I'm not giving the concrete statement, I'm just saying that, that, uh, that the constraints are more, more uh, involved than just the coincidences. Okay, so now that we have a way of thinking about the equivalent conjuring of the, of the Grassmannian, or, 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 or a Nakajima Q variety, I want to name some special elements in them, which will be named stable envelopes, or cohomological stable envelope classes. They will, there will be one for each torus fixed point, so the notation is tab sub p. 
So that's what I want to define. The definition is not on the, on the slide yet. So it will be on the next slide. So these definitions on, on this slide is just preparation for defining an element in the equivalent conjuring. So the preparation is the following. I'm going to fix a, uh, a one parameter uh, torus subgroup, which say, for example, this u maps to u to the first, u to the second, u to the third, and so on. For h bar, I plug in one. If, if that is fixed, then we can talk about this so-called Bjarjinski Birula cells. For every fixed point p, so I'm talking about now the second pink line, for every fixed point t, I can define the leaf itself, the collection of those points that under this one parameter, um, this one dimensional torus, they flow into the point p, right? That's what the definition says. So the limit of sigma z times x is equal to p. So we, it's called usually bb cell, but we call it the leaf, the leaf of that point. Actually, I will come back to the rest of this slide, but I'm going to jump ahead by one slide and show you an example. So look at only the left. And if you, and uh, so this is, of course, the moment graph. This is the skeleton of, the, of one of the Nakajima varieties. And the one of the fixed points is called 1, 4. And I don't know how much it's visible, but there is a, there is, uh, there's something shaded blue, or it, it looks like green for me here. The, all the points that, that flow into the, one, the, the fixed point 1, 4. So that's the, that's the leaf of 1, 4. So I'm going back. So if, if we have these notions of leaves, we also have a partial order by just taking that who, which fixed point is in the closure of which other, which, which fixed point is in the closure of a leaf of another fixed point. So that way you get a, a partial order. And if you have a partial order, then we, can, we are ready to define the, the bottom line on this slide, the slope of a fixed point. If you take the, the leaf of your fixed point, but also then you, you, you look at the points which are in the closure of that leaf, and then take the leaf of those, and then you look at the points which are in the closure of that leaf, and then those are fixed points in the leaf of those, and so on. So it's not just the closure of the leaf. It's, uh, these leaves all have the same dimension. So, so if, if you are familiar with working with, with, with um, uh, homogeneous spaces, think of the leaves as uh, the conormal bundles of a, of a Schubert cell. And conormal bundle of anything is always same dimensional. And uh, so here you take the leaf is the conormal bundle of your Schubert cell, but then on the boundary there are some other Schubert cells and take the, the conormal bundles of those as well, which have the same dimension and, then, and iteratively you do the same thing. So that's the slope. And it is illustrated on the, on the right hand side of this picture. So the, the slope of 1, 4 is the leaf of 1, 4, of course, but in the boundary there is 1, 5 or 2, 4, and then take the leaves of so. The, so whatever is is this painted bluish here is the is a slope of one four. Okay, so this this is the geometric part of uh, of a definition that is needed to define the stable envelope. This is the Maulik Okunkov axi uh, axiom definition of of stable envelopes in cohomology. So, um, so the the stab the stable envelope associated to a fixed point P is a unique class that satisfies three conditions. The first one is the support. It must be supported on the slope of that fixed point. Uh, the, the second axiom is a normalization that the stable envelope of P restricted to P itself, it, ha it has to be some, some, some expected obvious thing, namely the Euler class of the normal bundle of the slope there. So the slope is not a smooth manifold, but at P it is, it is smooth, so it has a normal bundle of it, it has a normal bundle in the, in the ambient space, and you take the equivalent Euler class. Uh, and there is a boundary axiom that if you restrict the, st the step of P to anything else but P, so I'm reading the bottom line, so anything else but P, then it will be divisible by H. So the stable envelope will have, be, will, will have a, a degree half of the dimension of the space. So, so all these uh, restrictions are of the same degree. So it's divisible by H means that uh, if for some person who, who doesn't see H just put plugs in H equals 1, then, then this means that the step restricted to Q is smaller degree than expected. So that actually we like to call it a degree axiom, that, that uh, the step table number of restricted to anywhere else but P, it collapses a little bit. So it's a smallness condition. Always you think of it as it's, the restrictions are small. Actually, maybe as a remark now that I mentioned the H equals 1, 
uh, substitution. So in, in special cases, for example, for G over P, the stable numbers were known before, and they, were, they have a name called the churn schwartz mcpherson classes. So, uh, so, so in special cases, it recovers some, some, some old notion with H equals 1. OK, so in this picture, I'm going to explain, just uh, further elaborate on the, on the axioms of step 1-4. So again, step 1-4 is a cohomology class, so it has components at, at every vertex. We know that these, these components cannot be arbitrary. They have, to be, uh, they have to satisfy some consistences. But let me see, beside these consistences, what other constraints we, we, come, we get from the axioms. For example, the one in yellow, it says that the stable envelope restricted to stable envelope of one four restricted to one four. It has to be some explicit thing, and then you see that I don't know. Uh, at, I hope the picture is rather intuitive. At one four, there are two directions which point out of the the slope, and the product of those uh, the Euler classes of those ha is has to be the restriction there. So the yellow yellow is that it, the restriction has to be that thing. It's equal to that. We also have the uh, the uh, the support axiom, and part of the support axiom means that restriction to 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 3 must be 0, because the, this class is, is supported on the slope. But more than that, for example, the, the support axiom tells me something about the restriction at 1, 5. Because you see, at 1, 5, there is a, there is a direction which is normal to the slope, which is uh, uh, to the to, to northwest direction at 1, 4. Since this is normal to the slope there, and, and the, the and the stable envelope is supported on the slope, uh, the stable envelope restricted here has to be divided by the, by the weight of that direction, in this case u1 minus u2 plus h. So the support axiom is more than just a bunch of zeros outside, even on the boundary it, uh, it requires some divisibilities. So I hope now uh, most of these uh, should, be, should be clear. And of course, divisibility by h is, a, is an explicit thing. At everywhere but at 1, 4, the restriction has to be divisible by 1, 4. So if you just look at this as, as it's presented on this slide, it looks like very combinatorial, saying that there is only a one tentacle of polynomials which satisfy the consistences, which I haven't really told you the derivative constraints. But anyway, so the consistences, there is just one tentacle which satisfies the consistences together with these axioms. But it's true. And that is the stable envelope. OK, let me check the time. Ooh, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, skip this part, I think. OK, so let's, uh, let's just regroup. I might come back to representa geometric representation theory connections, but uh, probably not. So, so far, what we have is that we have a way of thinking about uh, equivalent conjurings of Nakajima varieties. And we defined uh, cohomological stable envelopes of it associated to every fixed point. The way of thinking of that, the, 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 I would like, I like, I like to think of it as that is the class of this slope, right? So if, the, if there is a big ambient space and you have a sub variety, then it's, it's tempting to, to think about the, that as a cycle and that represents a cohomology in the ambient space as soon as you have some kind of Poincare duality type of uh, relation in the ambient space. So there's a cycle. So that is a one way of thinking about the, the, the class, the class of this uh, slope, but it's not really that class, it's really some kind of h-bar deformation of it. So if you take the, the highest degree, sorry, the, the, the coefficient of the highest h-power of this class, it has no h, h any, in it anymore, that is, uh, that is a, like a Schubert class type of object. So this is an h-bar deformation of, of uh, like 19th, 19th century fundamental class type of calculations. So that's what we have, and uh, okay, that's where we are so far. Okay, now we are fast forwarding. Uh, I, I, I'm just telling you that uh, the stable envelopes have a uh, generalization in K-theory and in elliptic cohomology. Uh, and uh, 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 there is no way I'm going to define those, not, not even the theories and, and even less the actual stable envelopes. But, but I, I want to give you some feelings about them. So first of all, the, what, how do I think about a K-theory element on a Nakajima variety or an elliptic cohomology element in the, in the um, Nakajima variety? So the first line says that a, sta a stable envelope or anything else, a cohomology element restricted to a point, 
is a polynomial in, in the equivalent parameters, right? Everybody agrees, that's what I said. But then the, the K-theory element is pretty much like that, except the restriction is a Laurent polynomial, not a polynomial. And in the elliptic, uh, uh, equivalent elliptic cohomology case, it's not a Laurent polynomial, it's an, it's an elliptic function. It's a section over a, over a product of elliptic curves in the same variables used. Okay, so that's one thing I want to say, is that the way you want to think about, for example, an elliptic cohomology element on the right, is a tuple of, of some elliptic functions. But there's one more thing on this slide, is that uh, in the elliptic line, I, I, I added more parameters, the Vs. And in the next few slides, I want to give an intuitive feeling that in, why in elliptic cohomology, when you want to talk about characteristic classes, you are forced to have some new parameters. These parameters will be called dynamical or killer parameters. I won't be able to, to give the precise mathematical statement, but I hope I will be able to give some intuition why you are forced to have some uh, ellipt uh, uh, new parameters. Okay, so first, uh, this is the t t look at the theta function. This is a section of a line bundle over the elliptic curve. The way I want, to look, I want you to look at it, this is that there is, it starts with x one half minus x to the negative one half, which is in, in, in logarithmic uh, variables, it's really s up to a constant, it's sine of x, which is the, which would be uh, just the k-theory part of it. So, so the theta function is really just a q-decoration, some q-deformation of the sine function. So you can think of it as a q-deformation of, of k-theory. And I will use this delta function, delta a, b is just a, a, you cook up from the theta functions another a two parameter function, delta a and b. Okay, this is just definitions, because then the next slide will be the one which uh, I hope uh, will give an intuitive feeling why in characteristic class theory in elliptic cohomology you need extra parameters. There's something which is not on the slide, so I just want to say that if you want to define some kind of characteristic classes, for example, stable envelopes, or there are many others. One approach, there are many approaches, but one approach is that you, you resolve your singular subvariety, you define some obvious thing in the resolution, and then you push it forward. But if you do this, you have to show that what you invented in the resolution, it was invented in the right way that your class does not depend on the resolution. So this, 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 this notion that you define the good class uh, should depend on some identities. That's for example, uh, the two uh, nearby resolutions are where you get the same class downstairs. And these identities are really all, always boiled down to one identity. Uh, in, in elliptic world, it boils down to the top identity. It's called phi's three-second identity. It says that if x1, x2, x3 is equal to y1, y2, y3, and they are both equal to one, then that, that product of that Okay, sum of products of delta functions is zero. It's a good exercise for your graduate students. So that theta was defined in the earlier slide, and then you, this is a, a... It turns out that about elliptic functions, this is the only identity. Everything else uh, follows from it, although highly non-trivially. Anyway, this is the identity which is behind the fact that in elliptic, characteristic, in elliptic world, you can define actually characteristic classes. Now, let's do the following, that take that top identity and plug in q equals zero, so let's go to k-theory. Then what you, what you get is the middle identity, which is, you see, a trigonometric uh, identity. Now you can give it to your, to your calculus students that if x1 plus x2 plus x3 is equal to zero, y1 plus y2 plus y3 is equal to zero, then this identity holds. So ignore the, the purple part for a minute. So this is the q equals zero specialization of the top line. And you can further uh, approximate sine of x with x, which, you know, which we always do, uh, then you get cohomology, and then the identity that you get is, is the bottom line. Okay, now look at the purple, purple decorations. Is that the identities for, uh, uh, in, in k-theory and in the rational limit, they are, they are um, easier, because they, they tell you more. They say that if the x is added up to zero, then the left-hand side is equal to one. And if the y's add up to zero, then the right-hand side is equal to one. In some, so you see that the, the identity splits to x variables and y variables. So because of that, in k-theory and, and in cohomology, what we did in, in, you know, in the past 200 years of mathematicians, we were not forced to work with the other set of variables. Because these identities, they, they, the, the governing identity behind characteristic classes, they, it separates to x and y variables.
So you can just take the left side of this slide and, uh, and then build up characteristic classes in cohomology and K-theory. However, in elliptic cohomology, the top identity doesn't, doesn't split to an X part and the Y part. You are forced to, to work with Y. Okay, so this is actually something elliptic cohomology taught us that we should do cohomology and trigonometry as well with two sets of variables, with the killer parameters, but we might need to uh, go out of our ways to, to, to introduce them. Okay, so uh, I, okay, this was the explanation of the bottom right corner of this space that stable envelopes are defined, and, uh, and, but they depend on new variables, which I call Vs. Any questions? All right, then, then we, uh, we come to this fact that, uh, which I call 3D mirror symmetry for characteristic classes. It turns out that there are, there are pairs of uh, Nakajima quiver varieties, let's call them X, X shriek, that uh, the pairing together comes with some uh, fixed bijection between the torus fixed points, for which the, the stable envelopes on one are equal to the stable envelopes on the other one in the sense which is on the slide that you, you take the stable envelope of P restricted to Q, P and Q are fixed points on one, and you take the stable envelope of Q restricted to P on the other one, then you have uh, polynomials or Laurent polynomials or elliptic functions, and they uh, claim that they will be equal if you switch equivariant and, and killer parameters as well as invert H bar. So, uh, so this is the, uh, the, the 3D mirror duality for elliptic uh, for elliptic uh, characteristic classes. Here's an example. So everything above the purple line is about one Nakajima variety. The, you see the, the cotingent bundle of P2. Sorry, yes. We have a question. Yes. How the elliptic stub transforms with respect to the modular modularity transformation? Yeah, uh, I, there is something and I never looked at it, so I'm, I won't be able to say. Of course, you should, you should restrict it to a point so that you really have an elliptic function. But uh, yeah. Oh, what should I? Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't. Okay, so let me continue. So over the over the purple line, it's all about the crew variety of cotingent bundle of P two. So you see that it has three fixed points. There is the skeleton of it is on the left side of the slide. It has three fixed points, and there are those are the constraints among the restrictions, and the table on the top is the elliptic stable envelopes. In, in the following sense, that you take the, take the rows of that table. So the, fir the first row is the stable envelope of F1, and that means that uh, it, th th that stable envelope restricted to F1 is that product of theta functions, restricted to F2 is zero, restricted to F3 is zero. And the middle line is the table envelope of F2, and so on. Now, the, uh, the 3D, uh, 3D mirror dual of that Nakajima variety is, is, is this uh, one in the, the, the one below the purple line, and that has a totally different looking uh, moment graph. But I think that's what I wanted to convince you with that as soon as you see the moment graph, you can write down the stable envelopes. At least in cohomology it's easy, in K-theory it's much less easy, and in elliptic it's, it's a lot of work, but, but for small ones you can do it. So as soon as you see that graph, you can calculate the stable envelopes, you will have the, this bottom table. Again, the rows are the stable envelopes. And the fact is that if you stare at this, uh, two tables that they are the same after transposing and switching U and V variables and inverting H. Okay, so this is, a, this is the baby example of uh, 3D mirror symmetry for stable envelopes. Here are some, some other random examples. Uh, uh, with green on the two sides, I'm, I'm indicating the dimensions of these varieties. Um, yeah, so you see the different dimensional varieties have have this amazing coincidence that characteristic classes of singularities in those varieties are equal in this sophisticated sense. Okay, the bottom line. The bottom line is that uh, uh, the left-hand side is, of course, a Nakajima variety, and I claim that there is no Nakajima variety which, uh, which is 3D mirror dual to it. But we will fix that later. Because now I'm starting the part two of the lecture. So maybe it's a good uh, point to ask questions if you have. Yes. Do you expect a stable envelope for cobaltism in cobaltism? Okay, I, uh, I guess yes, but it, it, you know, having a group versus a formal group law has some advantages, an algebraic group. So these three uh, varieties, that uh, three cohomology theories that I named, cohomology, K-theory, and elliptic cohomology, these are the cohomology theories that correspond to one-dimensional algebraic groups. 
which, is, which are part of the, f the formal group laws. So there are, there, are, they, they, there are advantages of working with formulas. So indeed, maybe there is a formula for, for the, uh, the most general cohomology theory, but I, I just, I just want, I, I'm a formula person, so, so I, I, I certainly want to look at these three. Do we have a question? Uh, in what sense are all theta function identities uh, de uh, derivable from the trisecant identity? Okay, so this is a sophisticated sense, and I won't be able to. I, I can find the reference paper, which I looked at, and uh, and I don't remember the details. But I just remember the the intuitive statement. Yeah. So just at the very beginning, we fixed this homomorphism from C star to T. So is that important? Yeah, so in, in the slides which I skipped, it is important. So if you, if you start playing with that, what uh, one parameter subgroup you choose, then you recover representation theory. So uh, after a while, I, will, I might comment on those. So the stable envelopes, of course, depend on that. The stable envelopes do, do depend on it. It's not infinite, it's just they depend on some, some chambers of choices. So there will be finitely many. And changing them, you recover Youngian R matrices and so on and so forth. So that's where representation theory starts to be built up. Okay, so from now on, I want, oh, I want to, to def, uh, okay, define, so, so, so give a feeling about what Boo varieties are. And actually, I want to advertise them. I think we should look at Boo varieties instead of queer varieties. Uh, they, they have some advantages. Okay, so uh, these will be associated to some combinatorial uh, pictures, combinatorial data. The combinatorial data will be called the brain diagram. Here's a brain diagram. So the brain diagram uh, combinatorially is just a collection of horizontal segments called D3 brains. They, they come with some non-negative integers, um, the dimension vector, but then the consecutive ones are separated by either NS5 brains or D5 brains. So I drew a, a blue or a red uh, skew line and so that you don't have to uh, memorize this, it's on, on this board out here, just because this picture will go away after a while. For future purposes, I will also decorate the D5 brains with equivalent variables U sub i and the NS5 brains with the killer parameters V sub i. So this is a combinatorial object for us. We can discuss some, some of course, some super string theory after. Okay, uh, okay, so what is the, what is the Cherkis bow variety? Start doing the same thing as you would do for quiver varieties, but only do them for NS5 brains. So look at the left side of the picture. If you see an NS5 brain, it's a red brain, then you just do the same thing as you would do for a quiver variety. Take home C and to C M, where, where you know N and M are the numbers, dec the decorations on the two sides. Take the cotangent bundle, and, uh, and uh, that, of, that of course has a, uh, an action of GLN cross GLM. So you do the, almost the same thing for the other type of uh, brain, five brains, but it will be a different space, not just the cotangent bundle of home C and CM. That is uh, the left-hand side I call the, the, the arrow, the arrow uh, edge, or uh, okay, arrow brain, and then this is the, the bow brain. Actually, this whole thing should be called a quiver, which you can put a, a, an arrow and, a, and both an arrow and the, um, a bow into a quiver. Anyway, so, so for, for the other type of brains, you put some other, I, I indicated roughly what that space is, but of course a lot of things are skipped in this proof, so what acts how, but it's also just a you know, Hamiltonian reduction or GIT quotient of, of, uh, of, of rather obvious spaces. The, 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 there's a the key difference is that on this other space, an extra group acts this C star that's in the bottom right of the slide, that uh, uh, there, there is a C star X. Because what do, you what do you do after that when you we want to build, build up the Nakajima variety is that you take the, uh, you, you take the product of all these, uh, all these T homes and, and B sub N M's, and then you do reduction by GLM cross GLM. You do the reduction by all the GLs. You do that, but the C stars will, will survive. So on the space that you get, there will be a C star action for every D5 brain. You see this, this realize that every D5 brain be decorated by an equivalent variable. So if you do this story, then, then what will this uh, Cherkis variety C? Script C of D will be the name of the Cherkis variety. Uh, it will be smooth. 
It will have a holomorphic symplectic uh, structure on it. It comes with tautological bundles coming from the D3 brains. So those numbers are the ranks of the bundles. Uh, it, uh, later I will show you that it has finitely many, finitely many fixed points. And it has a torus action. And the torus action comes from the D3 brains, plus there is a C star action from the fact that there were lots of T stars in the earlier slide. So everything that we liked about, like about Nakajima quivariate is are sort of true for this one. Everything is very combinatorial, and, uh, and there, there is an advantage, which will come very soon, I hope. Richard, may I ask a question? Yes. So where is the framing that is usually? It's uh, replaced by this. Uh, the D5 brains, correct. The D5 brains has come, OK. Somehow they, they collapse together to be the framing. Okay. Yep. Yep. So there is a dimension formula, of course, you don't have to memorize. You just uh, imagine that if you see the, the brain diagram with those numbers, the dimension vector, then from that you, you, you calculate the sum, and that is the dimension of the, the, uh, of the Cherkis Bull variety. For example, if you see this, uh, uh, this, bro this brain diagram that it's on the left bottom of the slide, uh, then you, you plug in the numbers and you will get four. It's not a surprise. This will be uh, T star P2, the, the Cherkis Bull variety associated with this brain diagram. So you might say that things are getting more complicated because the, the quiver name of T star P2 was just one dot and one square. And now it's somewhat longer. But uh, there will be things that we win, win at the end. OK, so this is dimension formula. Oh yeah, and I, I think uh, I'm going to answer your question now. How are quiver variety special cases? So what I need to give you now is a combinatorial recipe that if you see a quiver, how do you build up a bow, uh, a brain diagram? So the quiver has parts, this k and parts. Look at the top left part. And whenever you see this k and part, just, rip, just uh, throw a segment se uh, ending with NS5 brains, the red ones, and put n blue brains in between, where n is the framing of the, or the, the dimension vector of the framing, and decorate the D3 brains with k's. So this is just, and then, then glue together these segments. For example, look at the bottom example. Uh, and whatever is, is decorated by yellow, so that part will be just, just go to the brain, the brain diagram on the right, which is, decorate, which is de in, in, you know, shaded with yellow as well. But it, the quiver has another part, and just glue that part to the right of it. So you glue these segments together, and you will have a brain diagram. Yes? And this works only for type A quiver, Nagashima quiver variety, or for any? OK, uh, I only know type A. Mm -hmm. But what about loops? Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think the next slide. Okay. Okay. So certainly, I don't. I won't be able to do, you know, all kinds of loops. But one loop is fine. Uh -huh. So a tilde. Yeah. So yeah. Right. But otherwise, it's right. So, but but the make make an observation here that the brain diagrams that we get on the right they are special. They they have this co-balanced condition which is in the bottom very bottom line of the slide is that on the two sides of a D5 brain, you will always have the same numbers. OK, but here's the advantage that we do not have for quiver varieties. There is an extra, uh, actually there will be two extra uh, operations. This operation is 3D mirror symmetry. This is just the most innocent uh, symmetry uh, operation on these brain diagrams, just, just reflect it down, reflect it about a, a, a horizontal axis. Or in other words, uh, change red to blue and blue to red and so on. So let's call it 3D mirror symmetry for bow varieties. Let's uh, see an example. Let's find the, the 3D mirror dual of T star P2. So the top line is the, the brain name of T star P2. And we just formally create the 3D mirror dual of it. OK, I can calculate its dimension, its dimension 2. Uh, but then here we go a little uh, uh, depressed, because this is not co-balanced, so I cannot recover it as a, as a Nakajima quiver variety. However, I will be in a minute. I will be able in a minute, so just wait. Because I'm going to show another operation which exists on bow varieties, and it's called hanani witten transition. Think of it as like a Reidemeister move. So you can locally rebuild your brain diagram without changing the, the space. So the, the, the rebuilding is such that you can, if, if you have a consecutive D5 and NS5 brain, you can switch them. The price you pay is that, that the the dimension vector in the middle changes and changes the way which is on the, on the right. 
And the theorem is that if you carry out such a change on your combinatorial model, then the associated bow variety doesn't change its uh, the same. Actually, the torus, torus parameterization, the torus action reparameterizes a little bit, but, but yeah, for the purpose of this talk, it's just an isomorphism. OK, then let's continue this example that we saw uh, uh, one, a few slides up. That the first two lines are just, we found the, the, um, the three mirror dual of, of T star P2. But now I'm going to play the game of carrying out Hanan-Ibitten transitions. For example, first I carry it out at the yellow part. You see, and then, then, then I hope you can just carry out this transition. And then, then after that, I carry it out at the green part. I, I hope it's visible. And I will get uh, to the brain diagram that I'm, I'm pointing at, or in the middle of the right column of the slide. And this one is co-balanced. Okay? So I was lucky enough to be able to carry out hanani witten transitions to make my brain diagram co-balanced. And if it's co-balanced, then I can recover it as, a, as an Nakajima variety. So then we recover this thing, this example, the baby example of 3D mirror symmetry uh, or between two Nakajima Kubi varieties. Cool. Any questions? Oh, okay, so I want to give you a, a, an fine A type. So, so look at the, on the left of the picture, there are quiver varieties. On the right, we have the same varieties, but in their bow names. And the transition between them, everything follows from earlier slides. If you see a, a quiver, then there is a way of drawing a brain diagram. The 3D mirror dual is just uh, switching D5 and NS5 brains. And then in this one, it's such a simple thing that it's accidentally already co-balanced. So I, I, can, I can rewrite it as a quiver variety. This is, of course, a, a very well-known example, right, of, of Hilbert schemes and its dual. But you can play the game with more, more complicated uh, uh, a, a type A or FI type, type A uh, uh, queer varieties. OK, any question? Yes? Uh, is the correspondence in unique or? Uh, unique, so does it have an automorphism? Certainly, this is the natural one. So, so the. Uh, oh, so your, your question is that are there quiver varieties which are isomorphic to each other. So different combinatorial codes isomorphic to each other. Yeah, that, that I, I doubt. Yeah, I doubt. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I can, of course, I can, I can present the one-point space many different ways. So, uh, so, so maybe I, I have to be, work back on that. I'm not sure. OK, so, in, in, uh, so now I think uh, I, I explained everything which is on this slide. This is just a repetition of the first slide. That to find the mirror dual of, uh, of Grassmann 2C5, you just have to write its boo picture. Then formally take its 3D mirror and then carry out hanani moves if you can. And if you're lucky, in this case you are, and uh, then you will get, the, uh, you will get a, a queer variety. Right. Uh, what I want to talk about is some other very important uh, a structure that, that bow varieties come with. One of them is uh, brain charge. So it will be a number, an, an integer associated to every five brain. So an NS5 brain, it is, uh, it is just uh, the, the difference of the two numbers on the two sides of the NS5 brain, L minus K, plus the number of D5 brains on the left of it. So here you see that uh, this is now just type A, not F fine type A. In Fi type A, there is something local charge, but anyway, so this is, let it be just finite type A. And for D5 brain, a very similar integer associated. So K minus L plus a number of different type of five brains to the right of it. Here's an example. Is everything visible? Uh, not much. Take the, the leftmost NS5 brain. His brain charge is 2 minus 0, because these are the numbers on the two sides. Uh, Plus, plus the number of, of D5 brains to the left of it, which is nothing. So that is the top red 2 on, on, this, uh, on this diagram. So for some reason, I will collect these charges on, on the top and on, on to the left of an empty table. Okay? For, for the time being, this is just a decoration. So I collect the charges of NS5 brains left of this empty matrix, the charges of D5 brains on top of the empty matrix. It's actually a, 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 an easy theorem that the two charge vectors, the red and the blue charge vectors, is a complete invariant of the hanani witten class of, uh, of, of the brain diagrams. So, 
Hanani within class is the isomorphism. Is that you, if you, you switch two consecutive different type of brains, you have a different diagram, but the, the brain, the charges will not change. Yeah. And vice versa. So, so if, I, if I didn't want to define you both varieties, but both varieties up to Hanani written, then I would have just told you that they are associated to uh, a, a pair of vectors. This pair of vectors have this one extra property that the sum of the red numbers is the same as the sum of the uh, blue numbers. Okay. So uh, again, so up to Hananivitan transitions, uh, both varieties are, are when you, next to this empty matrix, you put arbitrary numbers on top and on the left, so that the, the sums add up together. And among these, the ones which are, uh, in, at least in one of the representatives, is a quiver variety. Th these are the ones which were in the top. The top vector is a, is a partition. Those numbers are weakly decreasing. And if you put numbers there fully one, then these are just uh, the topics of Schubert calculus. So why, why do we care? Because actually, if, you are, if you're coming from representation theory, then you, don't, then, then you think that you can, OK, so I, I didn't say enough to, to, to support this, but it's fact that in geometric representation theory, you, 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 permit your, you allow yourself to permute those numbers on top. But not here. Uh, so the representation theory is the same, but the underlying space is different. So if you want to look at the space, then then both varieties are more general than, than quiver varieties. And why, why do we like that both vectors are arbitrary? Because it comes from one extra operation, transpose, which is essentially 3D mirror duality. Which, so this was not complete for quiver varieties, as you can see. Oh, OK, so okay, since I keep mentioning geometric representation theory, I might say that the following. That, uh, so if you see these two vectors, uh, then the height of this, uh, this matrix is a number, say n, and then you say, take the Youngian of GLn. This is, that's a, a quantum group. Then those numbers on top, read them as, as, uh, as uh, if the numbers are a, b, then take lambda a of the, of the vector representation tensor, lambda b of the tensor representation, and so on. So you take the, the, the fundamental representations and multiply them together. That's a representation of a, of a quantum group. And now you read these numbers on the left and take that weight space of that representation. And it turns out that that weight space is, is very naturally identified with the cohomology of the associated Bow variety. Okay. So again, this is, the, why, this is why these spaces are important in, in geometric representation theory. On the equivalent cohomology rings of these varieties, quantum groups act. So one Bow variety is one, one weight space of such a quantum group. And this is true in, in K-theory and elliptic. Uh, is, is this the analog of this Mauri Kukunkov Yangian? Yeah, 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 it, this is exactly. So if, if this was, if these numbers on the top were just uh, partitioned, this is, is the Mauri Kukunkov Yangian. Yeah. And now, okay, okay that, that was just, okay. Because I want to tell, show you the, the beautiful combinatorics of fixed, torus fixed points. So if you ever uh, looked at the combinatorics of torus fixed points on quiver varieties, it was a couple of partitions and, and it was somewhat messy. It is a different picture here, of course, equivalent, and uh, of course, more general because for both varieties. And uh, I find it fascinating. So the claim is that fixed points are uh, in bijection with tie diagrams. A tie diagram is on the picture. It consists of ties. A tie must connect a blue brain with a, a red brain. And you know, my, my picture of drawing them in the skew lines, it tells you, yeah, so, so it, it's a natural way of connecting them. And, uh, and of course, each D, not of course, but it's true that every D3 brain has to be covered by ties as many times as this, as this multiplicity. So just imagine that you only see the brain diagram and the numbers, and it's your task to put ties there, and lots of choices. For this particular brain diagram, there are 123 brain diagrams. This is one of them. So this associated bow variety has 123 uh, fixed points. Here are the fixed points of, of Grassmann 2 C4. And you see there's a natural bijection between 4 choose 2, just like in any other, any other names. Uh, these, these tie diagrams beautifully transform under Hananividen transition, which looks like a right Meister 3 move. And they beautifully transform uh, with 3D mirror symmetry, just take the 
you know, the reflection of the image. So that means that not just that we have a, a, a bijection between Hanani with an equivalent Bo varieties, which should be because they are isomorphic, but there is a bijection, natural bijection between between 3D mirror dual Bo varieties. The bottom line is that that was needed for the 3D mirror symmetry statement. Let me also mention this other combinatorial gadget that this this matrix used to be empty, but now put put zeros and try to put zeros and ones there such so that the row sums are the red numbers and the column sums are the, are the green numbers. If you, are, if you manage to put zeros and ones in such a way, then you call it a, a binary contingency tables. The binary contingency table, you know these contingency tables come from statistics. But here it's only zeros and ones are permitted. It's also a, a, an easy theorem that fixed points are in bijection with binary contingency tables. Maybe, maybe I, I, I want to draw a picture. Is that, uh, that if you come from Schubert calculus, then, then you learn to work with, full, for example, the full flag variety. And everything about the full flag variety is, is, uh, is parameterized by, by, uh, by permutations. This is a permutation. In this language, what I'm saying is that uh, quiver varieties, in, quiver, in, the, in the geometry of quiver varieties, everything is parameterized by, oh no, first, no, first what I want to say is that a partial flag variety would be parameterized by an order set of subsets, which can be uh, identified with this, this kind of bipartite graphs, where the degree doesn't have to be one on the left. So it's like a permutation, but I permit coincidences on the left. This is a partial flag variety. Everything, Schubert cells, torus fixed points, everything is parameterized by these things. And in, with both varieties, all we are doing is that we are permitting uh, higher, higher degrees on the right as well. So bipartite graphs, which are the same thing essentially as binary contingency tables, are the, are the objects that, that parameterize all the, the, you know, the cells or torus fixed points or, or stable envelopes. So there will be a stable envelope for each of them. So on the right, on the right side, there are, there are the BCT codes of torus fixed points on Grassmann 2C4. Okay, so I think I, I at, a, at the beginning of this talk, I wanted to convince you that that, that to find characteristic classes from a space, you have to walk through the following path. From the space, first you find the torus fixed points. You also find the, the invariant curves, which I skip. There's combinatorics behind that as well. But then you have the moment graph. And from the moment graph, the axioms give you the, uh, the, the stable envelopes. So I gave you half of the story. I gave you the combinatorics of the, of the torus fixed points. Oops. Anyway, so, so so if you see what's on the top of this, uh, of this slide, then you can create the torus fixed points. You will have the vertices on the thing on the left. Yeah. And you do some more combinatorics, you will find the edges. You will find what's on there and, and with all the decorations. And then uh, the, the uh, stable envelopes are defined. From this one, you can calculate. OK, the same, same for this other one. I might, I might mention at this point that of course, that's how you define stable envelopes, but they are hopeless to calculate using the definition. So, so you don't really do that. So uh, as we are understanding better and better, so there is some kind of cohomological whole algebra type of structure among stable envelopes. You want to, 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 to by convolution, multiply two of them to get a third one. And there are some, some formulas uh, as well in certain special cases. OK, so then, then I'm just walking through something that I already showed you, is that if you start with those two diagrams, then you play the game, you will get the torus fixed point, you will get the invariant curves, you will have uh, these two graphs, and then you can calculate the stable envelopes and you recover this slide that you already see, you already saw. So all I want to say is that everything follows from just the brain diagrams, nothing else. OK. So this. Uh, statement that the stable envelopes match for, for uh, uh, 3D mirror dual Bo varieties is proved in certain special cases. For the Grassmannian and its uh, dual, it's proved by in a paper with Smirno, Varchenko, Zhu. For the full flag variety in type A being self-dual is, is, is proved in a different paper by the same authors, but in general type with, with Andrzej Weber. Uh, the hyperptoric uh, being 
3D mirror dual in terms of stable envelopes, with this dual is proved by Smirnov and Zhu. And, and we, we calculated finitely many other cases. Maybe I should emphasize many. So it's, it's, it's quite a well-established conjecture that it should happen. Of course, everybody thinks it should happen. This should, I mean, you, you might remember the, the, the Higgs branch, Coulomb branch interpretation of this in, in, uh, in Kalnitzer's talk. Sorry. They, they are, oh, that's a, okay, so may, may not, not, may not be, a, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> so certainly I'm not sure that that is a special case of what I'm presenting. Certainly the middle of the, the general G over L and when it's long run dual, it's not a, not a quiver variety or bull variety of type A. So that's not a special case of what I'm saying. That in, these are the cases for which the, 3D mirror symmetry for, for characteristic classes is established or proved. So here is a summary, and actually I'm on time. The summary of, the, of what we learned is that uh, if there are certain nice spaces, for example, varieties with a torus action, there is a characteristic classes, they have relations to enumerative geometry, they have relations to representation theory of quantum groups. Uh, uh, okay, I'm, okay. They are related to some, some very important Q difference equations and um, actually two sets of Q-difference equations. Um, so they are, they, they are yeah, I, I advise everybody to study them. They are very important notions. We also learned that uh, they come in pairs, such that the stable, uh, I mean the spaces come in pairs, and there is a, uh, such that the stable envelopes on the, on the two are related, and the, the natural pool of, uh, of uh, detecting it is, is bull varieties, which is close for 3D mirror symmetry, and, and easy combinatorics govern their 3D mirror symmetry. The end. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any question? What's the relation, if, if any, between the bow varieties and the construction of Coulomb branches we saw last week? So that's Nakajima Takayama uh, paper that they prove it that. Uh, that these bull varieties are the Coulomb branches, yeah. type A. Probably more general, but I understand the type A. There was a question in the Q&A, how the stub changes under the anani witten move. Is this clear? Yeah, so that's an isomorphism, so it shouldn't change. But the way I set it up, uh, you have to make some choices. So the way I set it up, uh, the torus gets reparametrized, but that just means that in, in one of the variables, uh, one of the equivalent parameters, instead of u1, you write u1 times h. But, but that, so it's an isomorphism, so it, it, there's no change. There, was another, there is another one. Uh, the bow variety description of a given uh, quiver variety includes some additional Keller parameters that were not visible on the quiver variety side. Do you know how this should be dealt with when a computer stable envelopes of bow varieties? We should, uh, I didn't understand the last sentence, yeah. but before that I want to say... Uh, do you know how this should be dealt with when a completely stable with. level of, of both varieties? So, so maybe my first remark is that uh, those, those Vs are also there for, for the quiver picture. They are, they, are, they are at these top vertices. So there is here, of course there's not enough. So this is V1 over V2 and this is V2 over V3. So the, this bottom, the, the top vertices are decorated by the Keter parameters. They call us, actually, the, the Kedar parameters are, they come from the Picard group. So there is a, there's a line bundle, the determinant bundle here and here and here, and these are the Kedar parameters. Okay, uh, the question, how to deal with them? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, in the definition of elliptic stable envelope, those, those, those play a role, and, uh, and they are just at the right place. And also, uh, it's quite, I, I don't know how you appreciate it or not, but the, the 3D mirror symmetry, uh, Equivalent parameters and Kira parameters just switched beautifully, so as they should. So that's uh, just for me just another incarnation of the fact that this is the right way, this is a good way of looking at these varieties. So here the equivalent parameters and Kira parameters, it's not clear how they switch, I mean, but in the bull picture it's rather nice. In the recent paper with Sarah Zanzi, you mentioned that there is some super geometry. Yeah. Yeah. So I only did the, the GLN part, uh, that it is, it is extended to GLNM with, with Lev Rosansky and myself, what happens is that each of these fibranes you can define 
for some of them you put a star and then you apply a in a, in a sophisticated sense you apply a Legendre transform there and there's, an there's a different associated space and in the cohomology of that not the Yangians of GLN but the Yangians of GLNM will act in, in cohomology. The geometric object, like can you explain what are the basic <laughs> this is, no, it's rather sophisticated. So first of all, I, we don't do it in the, in the GIT way, because first of all, there, this, this, we have to give up holomorphic symplectic structure. It might be Poisson, but certainly we have to give up the omega. Uh, so we rephrase the definition to uh, some, 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 some Lagrangian intersection definition, and then this is quite involved, and for me, and then, and then before each of them will be a Lagrange, generalized Lagrangian variety, and the original would be their intersection in some sense. But then, then for where there is a star, first you apply some Legendre transform, and then you intersect them. So that will be the new variety. So that's that's actually on the archive already. This paper, but okay, I should we should put here many of the things that I learned about physics and everything is from Lev Rosansky, so he certainly uh, deserves his name. Any further? Yeah. Uh, so it, uh, uh, is it possible to use the combinatories of these diagrams to calculate the stable envelope? In in some sense, they define it, but it's just just very complicated. So, so uh, actually, there is a, a student, Tommaso Botta, who has a, a great way of doing it in cohomology for in the quiver settings, and it's some kind of uh, cohomological whole algebra multiplication. I have, a, I have a, a paper from 10 years ago, but that's only in the Schubert calculus settings, that uh, if, you, if you take some, some cohomological whole algebra that, that Marcus will define tomorrow, <laughs> so I'm sorry to take it for granted, and then you take some natural elements one, there are many, many natural elements called one in it, and if you multiply them in the, in the right way, then it will, be a, it, it will be a cohomology class, and that is the stable envelope. But that is in some Schubert calculus settings when you take contingent bundles of partial flag varieties. But, but, but Marcus will convince you that this uh, cohomological whole algebra multiplication is, is, is non trivial. It's, it's beautiful, but it's not, it's, it's not just multiplication. It's non commutative, for example. Uh, the, by curiosity, the computation that you are mentioning, it, it, it does after <coughs> localization. Is it some shuffle algebra way? Actually, that's correct, but it's. it's oh, yeah. So I'm cheating a little bit. So. Uh, Indeed, that's a local calculation, right? So it's only for polynomials. Yes. So it's a shuffle algebra. Mm -hmm. But for elliptic, we are trying to set it up here. There are lots of technical difficulties. Any further question? Well, so I must say that Thomas Sobota does it for elliptic as well, but for quiver varieties. Okay. Maybe then you can point me out with some. Yeah, except. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's thank. Uh, Let's thank each other again.